In his Master of Arts thesis in Latin American Studies, Nathan Watson at the University of uh, Miami said, musical instruments, many of them in the percussion family, are among the cultural goods brought across the Black Atlantic during the periods of colonization. As new world cultures and traditions developed, these instruments developed their own identities and stories. The instrument that I want to talk about today is the berimbau. The berimbau, the iconic symbol of capoeira, regardless of physical accomplishment in order to be a competent capoeirista, you also have to be a competent berimbau player. The berimbau sets and controls the game. We kneel at its foot, pay homage, ask protection, or reset the game. The berimbau, especially the gunga, is played by the maestri or the highest ranking students, always positioned to be able to see the door. To be handed the gunga in a hoda by a maestri is a coming of age. In the hoda, the berimbau is our commander, and for many, it is also our nemesis. The creation myth that I was taught about the Berimbau was uh, that a woman went to a stream to drink. She knelt down and cupped her hands and as she did so, a man approached from behind and killed her. She fell into the water and sank to the bottom and as her body touched the bottom, she was transformed into the Berimbau. It would be nice just once to approach a topic and not encounter controversy. Unfortunately, this is not that topic. Uh, in the case of the musical bow versus the hunting bow, there is considerable disagreement as to whether one inspired the creation of the other or if they evolved side by side. In any event, the musical bow is one of the world's oldest instrument types it is depicted in cave paintings dating back some 13,000 years, and it is the ancestor of uh, many modern string instruments, just to name a couple, the lute, uh, the banjo, um, and the harp. Africa, unlike Brazil and Portugal, is rich in bows being used exclusively for musical purposes. So presumably, the musical bow was carried to Brazil aboard the slave ships. Homogenization of African cultures within the crucible of the Sanzala gives rise to what is uniquely Afro-Brazilian. The earliest known description of some sort of ritualized combat is in Jean-Maurice Rugenda's 1763, uh, A Picturesque Journey Through Brazil. In it, he describes a fighter's cheering and clapping. Uh, he does reference the use of a small drum but uh, not any sort of stringed instrument. There are descriptions of Afro-Brazilians using musical bows uh, during the same period of time. The instruments, however, appear in a context other than sport or fighting. As is depicted here, uh, the instrument is used by a vendor to, uh, to attract uh, the attention of customers. In the early 19th century, the Portuguese court fleeing uh, Napoleon's army, uh, arrived in Brazil. Uh, their arrival marked the beginning of measures uh, to repress Afro uh, and indigenous uh, Brazilian cultural expression. Capoeira in particular was targeted. The origin of the word berimbau is not known. Uh, there are many, many theories and there are many Brazilian words that sound similar including words that describe stringed instruments. The earliest recorded use of the term berimbau uh, is found in, a, in an 1817 uh, travelogue by L.F. Tolinar. He uh, describes an instrument uh, that sounds very much like the berimbau that we use today. Interestingly, he, uh, he says uh, that uh, he heard the music, but he didn't uh, observe uh, if it was used for a dance or not. So uh, it, uh, it could be as early as that time that the bidding bell began to serve its purpose uh, as obscuring uh, people's activities. 
through the uh, 19th century, uh, oppression of Capoeira continued. Uh, by uh, 1820, there were actually special police officers assigned to watch Capoeiristas. And the Banning Bow begins to be associated more and more with Capoeira. Uh, by the middle of that century, the, uh, the presence of musical instruments uh, helping to, uh, to protect uh, players. These styles of capoeira differed quite considerably throughout the country. Uh, in uh, Hue and Hasifi, the uh, style was quite a violent fight game, uh, whereas in Bahia, it was more of a ritualized uh, dance fight. Um, the bedding bow, therefore, was much better suited to the game that uh, was taking place in Bahia. Which is perhaps why uh, Capoeira and Bahia, and Bahia remained strong, while uh, in other parts of the country it was uh, almost extinguished. In 1888, Brazil finally saw legislation abolishing slavery. Former slaves, now unemployed, and many homeless uh, began migrating toward uh, the cities, only to find a lack of work and waves of immigrants uh, competing for what work there was. Capoeira suddenly became a commodity. It could be used either uh, as a gangs for hire or to busk with on the streets. Both activities, though, uh, loaned an unfavorable image to the bidding bell. And just five years later, Capoeira was outlawed altogether. Historian Antonio Liberac Pires compiled uh, the few re police reports uh, that exist from that period of time. One report uh, from 1918 in Santo Amaro, Bahia, tells the story of Manuel Enrique Pereira, supposedly the real name of the famous Bizoro, who was involved in um, an assault on police officers over a bedding bow and uh, apparently uh, he later appeared at the police station and um, asked to have the bedding bow returned. Interestingly, the report notes that the bedding bow was among the pile of weapons that were confiscated. Mestre Pestina gave a really fascinating series of interviews. In one segment, he discusses not only the fact that Capoeira continued to be practiced despite its being outlawed, um, uh, but that uh, baiting bows were weaponized at, at the time. Um, he says, uh, when everyone is happy, it's an instrument. We use it as an instrument. And at the moment of duress, it transforms from an instrument into a scythe. He continues, I tell you, in my day, I used to have a little curved blade the size of a key, and the blade had a slot and a ring to fit into the wooden bow. Then, when the time came, I would dismantle the bedding bow, attach the blade, and it was ready to use. Uh, he goes on, um, if we were playing capoeira with a bedding bow, they, meaning the police, would try to rip it out of our hands and break it. And then things turned nasty because many capoeiristas did not want to lose their instrument, so we had a fight. As the 20th century progressed, capoeira began to emerge from the shadows. The cavalleria toque was heard less often. Tourism began to increase, creating a market for street hodas and also for the purchase of souvenir bedding bows. The 1930s saw a military coup in Brazil. Uh, it gave rise to a sense of national pride and to valuing cultural expression. The era of Bimba and Pestina had begun. Capoeira as we know it uh, was beginning to take shape and the Bimba was firmly entrenched in it. By the 1960s, the bedding bow was included in virtually all types of popular music. Life has changed. The bedding bow is no exception. It continues to evolve. Uh, some recent innovations are cabasas built with built-in pickups, which actually to me sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. But anyway, 
uh, tunable bedding bows, electric bedding bows, and fiberglass bedding bows. Interestingly, uh, there doesn't seem to be much development in the way of handles, which really is too bad. So I wanted to share this photo uh, of a musical bow. Found a couple of possible names, and I'm not sure which is correct. Uh, but what I thought was interesting was the way he holds it. The weight of the instrument is not resting on his pinky, uh, but he's holding uh, the verga with his hand. And rather than using a pedra, um, it's his thumb that is manipulating the um, arani. Um, I'm not actually sure if this is more comfortable than the way we currently play Berimbao, but um, who knows?